Hello and welcome to the Reviews Brothers. I've talked about a lot of games on this channel, but I've never really mentioned my favourites. So I've decided to look at every console that I've owned, and I'll be choosing my 10 favourite games for each one of them. We're going to start with the NES, because why not? As with a lot of people, I got this, well actually my brother did, back in the late 80s and we loved it. We had a decent selection of games, but I will warn you now that we never had the likes of Zelda, Castlevania, Mega Man or DuckTales, so there's none of that on here. Even without those though, we had some pretty damn good games, and even some that aren't that great but still hold a special place in my heart. So how about I shut the hell up and we take a look at some games in no particular order. We are going to start with Balloon Fight from Nintendo, released in 1984, a whole year before I was born. This is a port of an arcade game, and like some of the best ones out there, it's incredibly simple. You play as a balloon kid, and you've got two balloons strapped to your back. Then you're plonked onto a single screen where there's other punk ass mofos that have a single balloon. Your mission is to fly around the single screen stage and hit the other people from above to pop their balloons. When you do this, they'll float down where they will either land on some land, of course, where after a few seconds they'll start blowing up new balloons to come back and get revenge. To stop them from doing this, you want to hit them again, either on their way down when they have their parachute out or when they're on the ground, and they'll be killed off completely. Sometimes they'll land in the water, that's at the bottom of the stage, and they'll drown. Or in an awesome and unexpectedly dark turn, sometimes a giant fish will come out of the water and eat them whole. I love it when this happens, because there's some really spooky music as well. But be careful, as the fish will also eat you if you spend too much time close to the water, jumping out and munching down on you. As you will have noticed though, the enemies have spiky faces, and they'll be trying to pop your balloons as well. You can take two hits, but unlike the enemies, you can't blow up more balloons, so even if you're above ground, you die. Every few stages you get a bonus level, where balloons appear from pipes and you get points for the more you pop. Of course, the more points you get, the more extra lives you earn. Also, when you get to one of these stages, your balloons are returned to you, which is handy. The game actually only has 12 levels, and these loop on repeat until you lose all of your lives, with enemies getting faster each time. The levels start simple, but you'll soon get bumpers that knock you all over the place, trickily placed platforms that are hard to get around, and even clouds that shoot lightning that bounces around the level until it hits someone. It does get surprisingly tough, but really it would have been nice to see more stages. You can actually play this game in two player co-op as well, working together to kill everyone on the screen, but be careful as you can pop each other's balloons. There's also balloon trip mode. This is a simple gameplay mode where you fly from right to left, avoiding all the lightning and collecting balloons for points. This also goes on forever and is just to see how far you can get, but it's surprisingly addictive and tells you what rank you are. My highest is about 23 or something and I know I'll keep going back for more tries. Graphically, the game is nothing special really, but it still looks okay with some nice simple graphics that do the job. The controls are spot on, you can either tap the A button to fly or hold the B button down. These work perfectly and the physics are decent, so you'll soon get used to it all. I still really like playing this game and it's one that holds up very well thanks to its simple gameplay and overall just fun factor. Give it a go if you haven't, you'll be hooked. Here's Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers from Capcom. Based on the awesome cartoon of the same name, this is a one or two player platform game. The evil fat cat has kidnapped Gadget, and I don't blame him. So first things first, you set off to go get her back. After a few levels you manage to do that, but fat cat escapes, so you set off over some more levels to kick his ass, cause if nothing else, chipmunks are vindictive little shits. The levels you'll visit are all pretty varied, and as you're tiny, there's a lot of large stuff all over the place. You visit gardens, forests, casinos, sewers, kitchens, and more. Luckily, in all of the levels you'll find hundreds of tiny chipmunk-sized boxes, which you can use to pick up and throw at enemies to defeat them. Also, when you grab a box, you'll sometimes find items like health, extra lives, or a little bottle of crack that gives your throws more power. You also find loads of flower icon things. Get enough of these and you'll get extra lives floating onto the level to collect. With the boxes, you can only throw them upwards or forwards, and they can be tricky to aim at enemies that aren't exactly in your direct line of sight. Also, when you're carrying a box, if you crouch, you'll hide inside it like Solid Snake, and if an enemy walks into you while you're like this, they'll take damage, which is a nice way of killing fast enemies that don't take many hits. 
There's also a ton of enemies, mostly fat cats henchmen, but also some other random wildlife that wants you dead. Most levels also have a boss fight, but these are actually very easy for the most part. They've got very simple patterns to figure out, and some don't even move at all. There's always a red ball on the screen which you just need to throw at them half a dozen times and then you're done. In fact, the game in general is pretty easy, and you'll likely beat it on your first couple of tries. Now there are some tricky bits in there, but that's mainly down to some very annoying enemy placement that makes them hard to avoid. But if you've played the levels a couple of times, you'll know exactly what to do and where they are. And some levels are just a case of getting to the end, and you don't even have to fight a boss. It's still really a fun game to play though, and as mentioned, it can be done in two-player co-op. But this is actually harder, as you can't pass through the other player. So when you're doing some tricky platforming, you can actually block each other's path and fall to your death. And you can hit each other with boxes as well, but this doesn't kill you, you just get stunned for a second or two. The game does look really good with some bright visuals, and every level has its own enemies and a really distinct look, which is always appreciated. Chippendale themselves do look great, but they play exactly the same, which is a bit of a shame. Controlling though is very quick and responsive. If you want a nice, pretty easy game to breeze through, this one is well up there. It can be beaten in about half an hour, maybe a bit more on your first few tries, but again, it's one that I come back to whenever I fire up the NES, and you should too. Next up is Donkey Kong Classics. This is another port. This time you get two games for the price of one. First of all, there's the classic Donkey Kong, where you play as Mario, or Jumpman as he's sometimes known back then, and you've got to navigate all sorts of tricks, traps and obstacles to rescue poor Lena, who's been nabbed by Kong. Mario can run and jump, but can't fall too far, so you really have to be careful here, and if you fall more than your own height, you'll lose a life. Also, you can only take one hit before snuffing it. Depending on the level, DK will throw various things at you, which move in a variety of patterns. There's also moving platforms, enemies and holes that you've got to look out for. On your first time playing, the game is surprisingly tricky, but you will soon get used to it. There's only three levels, but these loop infinitely, getting faster and faster every time, and more enemies on some of the levels. It does get really tough, but it's all about those high scores. The second game is Donkey Kong Jr. This time round, you play as Donkey Kong's son, who has to rescue Daddy Kong, who's been imprisoned by the evil Mario, presumably because he went on a murderous lady kidnapping rampage, which is kind of fair enough, really. Anyway, Donkey Kong Jr. has to go through some whopping four levels here, and this one is noticeably tougher than the first game. The levels are still one screen each, and here you have to run, jump, climb using the vines that are handily present in every level. Your speed is determined by how you grab the vines. If you're going upwards, you want to hold onto two vines with one in each hand, which makes you move much faster. If you're descending, you'll want to hold one vine with both hands, and you'll go down faster than Toby Von Doom after a shot of tequila. There's plenty of enemies here too, they all have patterns for you to keep an eye on. And you'll see fruit in the vines. If you touch this, you can drop it on enemies below to defeat them. But enemies tend to just keep coming, so unless you really want that high score, I'd say ignore them and just focus on getting to the end. Again, the levels will loop forever until I'm pretty sure it just becomes physically impossible to win. Both of these games look fine, but aren't going to blow you away. They are kind of accurate representations of the arcade games, but nothing special. Thankfully, the controls are spot on though, and really make them fun to play. It's one of those games where if you die, you know it's your fault and not the game, which is annoying as I have nothing else to blame. You can play both of these in two player, but that is a case of taking turns. This is really a fun package, and it's one that's always fun whether it's 15 minutes or a couple of hours, and it will fly by surprisingly quick. Definitely check it out. Now here's an obvious one, but for good reason. It's Super Mario Bros. 3, released in 1988, believe it or not. Now I'm sure most people will know everything about this one already, but in case you don't, Princess Toadstool has been kidnapped by the evil King Koopa, or Bowser, or whatever name they wanted back those days. Mario and Luigi, if you're playing two-player mode, have to travel through eight worlds, each with a ton of levels within them, until you get to Bowser's castle and kick his Koopa butt. The thing is, with Mario 3, is that there's just so much to it. Every level offers something new, either with new mechanics, a new way to create tricky platforming, or even a new suit for Mario to wear. You get the usual bunch of Mario enemies, like Goombas, Koopas, Bloopers, etc. As well as this, you get a bunch of new ones. 
You can jump on most of their heads to defeat them, but you also get the usual fire flower power up, and on top of that there's a load of new suits. Most famously there's the raccoon suit, which you get from grabbing a leaf of course. This lets you fly and gives you access to loads of new hidden areas, and on top of this you can swing your tail to kill enemies. You also have Frog Suit Mario who hops everywhere, it's pretty useless outside of water, but if you're in water it makes you much more nimble while you're swimming. Then you get the fabled Tanuki Suit, which is basically the same as the Raccoon Suit, but by pressing down and B you turn to stone for a few seconds which makes you invincible. And then of course there's the infamous P Glove, and make sure you check out the Secret Levels podcast to learn more about that. All the suits in the game are just so fun to use, and what's cool is that you have a map screen and an inventory where you can store the suits that you've collected, as well as other power-ups like mushrooms, fire flowers, and some other items that you find on the map screen that can only be used on the map. You can choose to use your items before levels, so when you start the level you've got a certain power-up already, or you can use items on the maps to find even more hidden things. There's just so much to do here. The variety in levels is great, if you're not a cheat like me and don't use the warp whistles, each world really has its own unique style, and even a few gameplay types, and there's castles and battleships to also make your way through. It's not easy though, and even though most of the levels aren't too challenging, the later stages really are, and you will have to do some pretty precise platforming and need your wits about you if you want to get all the way to Bowser. As you can see, the game looks great for the NES and is easily one of the best on the system, and the same goes for the music and sound which are all great and surprisingly epic in places. Of course, playing the game is always a joy. If you've got a NES then I'm assuming you already have this one, but if not it's available on the Switch and just about everything Nintendo related, so you really have no excuse not to play it. It really is one of the best, if not the best, on the system. Marble Madness is another arcade conversion that I loved on the NES. It's a very simple game, as you'd expect. You are a marble, and you have to get through a handful of mazes before the time runs out. There's only five levels in total, but you'll be surprised at how long it takes to beat them all. Well, actually not long at all, only about five minutes, but you won't beat them on your first try. The mazes are pretty tough to get through and they're full of twists and turns, and on top of that there's obstacles everywhere that will throw you around, melt you, smash you to bits, or just knock you off the maze altogether. Every time this happens you lose valuable seconds, and you don't get a whole lot of time to begin with. Controlling your marble can be a little bit tricky, but it definitely works here. You just use the d-pad to move, and you've got a couple of options for which direction does what, and both work surprisingly well. You've got to account for momentum here, as well as gravity and some physics, so you really do need to build up speed if you want to get over some of the larger lumps and bumps, and this can be really tricky to do, so you'll need to get used to what the courses look like so you can take them at high speed where possible. And really, that's all there is to the game, it's very simple, you're just a marble and you get through the maze. You can play this one in two player, which sees you and a friend racing to the finish at the same time. This is really good fun, but can make it even harder, as you can get held up by your friend, or you can bump into each other and knock them off the edge. It is great fun though. The game looks fine, it's pretty basic, but for 1984 it's alright. The mazes themselves do actually have a good sense of 3D, and it's impressive on how much every lump and bump does affect the momentum that you have, and you'll need to get used to how it all works. Even though you can finish the whole thing in about 5 minutes when you know what you're doing, it will take a little while before you actually make it all the way through, and in fact going back and playing it for this recording, I couldn't even get past the 5th level. This is another game though that I will always spend a few minutes with when I've dusted off the old girl, and it never gets old. Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu is a really cool platform game that I remember getting from WH Smith's in Winchester where I grew up. In it, not surprisingly, you play as Jackie Chan, who at the time I actually had no idea who he was, but I loved his big cheeky cartoon face on the blue box. You have to go rescue his sister, who's been kidnapped by an evil emperor because she has the audacity to be a woman, and we can't have that in the 80s. This was a dumb move though, as Jackie Chan knows Kung Fu. So he goes on a quest to punch and kick everyone he sees in the face until he finds her. You'll explore forests, castles, cloud kingdoms, and even more castles on your quest to get your sister back, and each level is packed with enemies, a lot of which are specific to the level itself, which is nice. 
It's alright though, as Jackie Chan can punch, kick, and just like in real life, shoot fireballs by holding down his attack button for a few seconds. You'll also find frogs in levels. Make sure you punch these in the face because they're slimy bastards. And also they'll spit out power-ups, either health or one of a variety of attacks you can use by pressing up and attack. These come in the form of roundhouse kicks, upside down kicks, and even forward roll things. These moves are very powerful, though you only get to use each one a few times, so use them sparingly. Enemies will drop orbs when you beat their faces to a bloody pulp, and when you collect 30 of these, your health and fireballs will be restored. This comes in handy as levels are pretty damn tricky, and you only get one life, though you do get a few continues. If you do die, even at a boss, you have to start from the very start of the level. And speaking of bosses, these are good fun to fight. They're not the hardest ones out there, but they are suitably big. They do tend to just stay in one place on the screen while you avoid their slow attacks and punch the snot out of their weak point. What's also cool though is that the levels themselves. They're very varied and you'll be doing platforming at the same time as kicking ass. You'll be on a raft going down a river one minute, then you're in the sky jumping from turtle to turtle, and there's little nice touches everywhere, like if you fall down you rarely die, instead you just go to a different part of the level, or sometimes you can get a glimpse of some of the evil bosses before having to take them on. The game looks really great, with some very large detailed sprites, and on the enemies as well. The bosses are good, but don't really animate which is a shame. The levels themselves have loads of detail in them, and the variety on each one is very impressive, there's always a lot going on. And it's just a joy to play. The controls are spot on, and fighting is excellent, even though it's pretty simple. It does what it needs to though. And this is not a long game, and with a bit of practice, you'll be able to get through the whole thing in about half an hour or so, though it is well worth your time, and one that you won't get tired of playing through. Another one, of course, I recommend adding to the collection. Micro Machines is a game my brother and I put a lot of time into, battling it out to be the best toy racer. So yeah, it's a racing game, featuring a whole load of everyone's favourite miniature vehicles. In the single player you pick from a ragtag group of unlikable characters, each of which control slightly differently, though it can be hard to tell the difference between a few of them. And some of them look like they're losers, so you'll never choose them, and you'll always choose Spider, the cool guy. Once you've chosen your character though, you go through a series of races against three other opponents that you get to choose yourself. Now this is actually quite tactical, as some races are more difficult than others, and every three races, whoever has raced the worst, gets eliminated and you choose a new person to join the tournament. This means you have to decide if you want to race the harder people early on and save some of the weaker ones for the harder tracks, but of course doing this means you might lose and not get that far yourself. You don't get to choose your vehicles or tracks, this is all done in a certain order, and this is a bit of a shame as you don't get any cups or anything like that to choose from. There's about 25 races in the game, and about 10 or so vehicles, including dune buggies, Formula 1 cars, sports cars, motorboats, helicopters, and even tanks that you can shoot each other with, but you always play the whole game in the same order. The courses are all really varied, having tiny vehicles really lends to some imaginative level design. You'll be racing all over the house, on pool tables, in the bath, across kitchen tables, or in the garden. The levels are all great and have all sorts of hazards like food, cutlery, plants, and even things like screws and tools. These are placed around the course in pretty annoying places, but deliberately so. This definitely adds to the already considerable challenge. You've got three laps per race with very little room for error, and you don't get any sort of map, so memorization is key here. You probably won't win many, if any, of the races on your first try, thanks to some windy courses that are very fast and easy to fall off. You'll be falling off tables, as well as exploding on hazards, and if you do, it can take a while to get back on the course. And it only takes one wrong move to go from first place to last place, and as the courses aren't that long, it means you barely have any time to catch up to the others. Oh, and don't think you can be cheeky and just do some off-roading, as if you stray too far from the course, you'll explode in a puff of smoke and are taken back to the track. When you're racing, you have to come first or second to get through to the next race. Any lower and you lose a life and have to retry. You do get a few continues, but if you lose them all, you have to start from the very first race no matter what. And this can be annoying, as it means you will be playing the same races over and over until you've learned them. There's no practice mode or time trial, so the only way to practice is just to keep playing the game over and over. Thankfully, it is fast paced and it controls well, so you won't really mind. 
Multiplayer works a little differently, it's not a case of racing three laps, instead you have to just race better than your opponent, so they're forced off the screen behind you and you get a point. First one to fill their score point wins. This is a bit different, but it's fun and easy to get the hang of, and you'll be having loads of fun in no time. The single player is pretty damn tough, but it is doable, and it's still good fun if you can handle the challenge, and I think it is one that you should play. Capcom's Gunsmoke is a really cool scrolling shooter with a Wild West theme. You're an unnamed gunman who goes around the West taking down people with bounties. In this particular case, it's a nasty gang called the Wingates, who've been causing all sorts of havoc. At the start of every level, you're shown who the boss is, and then you scroll up the screen shooting everyone you see. Enemies will pop out of everywhere to take you down. Some shoot at you, some just run at you, some jump all over the place, and if you touch anything at all, you're dead. If you do die, you'll be set back a little way, but never too far. Thankfully, you've got pistols with unlimited ammo. Pressing B shoots to the left and A shoots to the right. Pressing both buttons together lets you shoot straight ahead. Your pistols are pretty powerful, but in the levels you'll also find villagers, who act as shops. One of them sells you weapons, and you can buy a spread shot, a machine gun, a smart bomb, and a really powerful magnum. These are all very handy in various situations, but they use ammo, so you can't go too mad. The other person's shop sells you ammo, a horse which lets you take an extra couple of hits, and most importantly, a wanted poster. You see, the boss of every level won't appear unless you have the poster for that stage. As you'd expect, the poster is the most expensive thing to buy, but if you're lucky, you might actually find it hidden somewhere within the level itself. You can find them on every level, but to do that, you have to shoot every inch of the level and listen out for the sound of you hitting something even though there's nothing there. Once you find that spot, keep shooting it and the poster will appear. If you don't have the poster, then the level just keeps looping and looping until you do. Thankfully, murdering anyone you see gets you money, so even if you can't find the hidden one, it won't take long to find it from the shop. The bosses themselves are all good fun to fight, but not really all that hard, especially if you have the magnum with a bit of ammo. But getting to them isn't the easiest thing to do, as the levels are really packed with enemies and some of the backgrounds are designed so it's hard to see the shots that they fire. Tricky bastards. This is another game that once you've had a bit of practice, you'll be able to beat the whole thing in about half an hour, but it really is a blast from start to finish, with some awesome western themed music to boot. The only RPG we had growing up on the NES was Faxanadu, and I loved it, even though I've never actually managed to finish it. Here you play as a bloke who gets back to his village to find that the tree of life that it's built around has been infested with monsters who are draining their life from the tree. Bastards. The king gives you 1,500 gold coins that you can use to go kit yourself out with weapons and items to start your adventure. Now, it would have been nice if the king just gave you the best weapons and armour as he's asking you to go and kill hundreds of deadly monsters, instead it's barely enough money to buy a knife and a shield, and more importantly, a key. And the keys here are some of the most important items in the game, as there's locked doors all over the place that require one of a few keys, a jack, king, queen or king key. The problem is, these keys can only be used once and then they vanish into the ether. However, once you've gone through the door and then back out, it's magically locked again and you'll need to go and buy another one to get back in. Basically, you just want to buy a few of every key that you can to stop having to backtrack too much. Of course though, you're also going to need to buy a whole load of new equipment to stop those pesky monsters, so you'll be doing quite a lot of grinding here, and that is really is the key to this game. As you will have noticed by now, the game is all played like a 2D platform game and you get experience, but really it's your equipment that makes the big difference in making you stronger. You'll come across a load of different towns as you're exploring the massive tree and climbing to the top, and these all have different stuff to buy, a lot of which is pretty damn expensive. And it is bloody hard, so I really recommend having some patience and spending quite a while to kill the first few enemies over and over as they do respawn every time you leave the screen. Spend a while doing this, so you can go back to the nearest shop and basically just buy everything you can. Shields are really handy as they'll block projectiles, and the various weapons have different ranges and power levels. And what I really love is that everything you equip actually appears on your character, so by the end of the game you've got a full set of dragon armour, it's great. And you really will need it, because the monsters aren't messing around here. 
As you go up the tree, you'll find all sorts of dungeons and dilapidated looking areas filled with deadly monsters that will kick your ass. You also get magic to help you, which you use with the classic up and attack. This comes in the form of fireballs, laser waves and other strange things, but they're bloody powerful. You can run out of magic though, so make sure you spend some of your hard earned money on magic potions. And keys, don't forget the keys. There's also some large bosses here as well. These also seem really hard at first, until you find that most of them you can cheese with a certain weapon or by standing at a certain spot on the screen. Most of the time though, you'll be panicking too much to figure that out. Probably the biggest annoyance for the game though is that there's no battery save. Instead you have to visit a priest who gives you a stupidly large password that's full of capital letters, numbers, grammar and all sorts. Make sure you've got a pen and paper handy when playing this game, unless you can save state of course. Graphically the game is good, but the colour scheme is a little drab, which is a bit of a shame. The monster designs though are really cool, and the world is a big sprawling place that can be hard to navigate, though there is a fair bit of variety. If you like a challenge and a bit of sexy grinding, then you might enjoy this as much as I do. And finally, here is Probotector 2 Return of the Evil Forces, or if you're not from the UK, Super Contra. In case you don't know, the Contra games were called Probotector over here in the UK. The games are exactly the same, but replace all humans with robots, because killing humans is bad. Anyway, the game has an overly complex plot when you really look into it, but in a nutshell, aliens have turned up, so you've got to go shoot them in the face. I've got very distinct memories of playing the first level of this one over and over, as I was only about 6 when I first got it, but I stuck with it, and even to this day, I can complete the game with relative ease. It's just so fun. You blast your way through jungles, caves, enemy bases, and eventually you come across the alien hive, which is totally an alien ripoff, but that's fine. And you've got to get to the queen and blow her tits off. Most of the levels are side-scrolling shooters where enemies will constantly be coming at you. Thankfully though, you've got plenty of options for blasting their faces off, but really, you're only going to want one weapon. You start with your standard pea shooter, and that works pretty well, but it is weak. In the levels, you'll see flying orb things coming through, shoot these and they'll drop weapons and power-ups. There is a machine gun, a laser gun, a flame shot, and of course the one that you're looking for, the spread shot, which you just want to get and keep for the whole game. It's powerful and takes up most of the screen, which is always a good thing. Every few levels are top-down ones, and I really like these, it's a really good way to break up the action. Of course, every level ends in a massive boss fight. These can be tricky, unless you have the spread gun, in which case they're kind of easy. They do fire a lot of projectiles at you, but my many years of playing the game clearly have come in handy. As well as the enemies, you've got to contend with some quite tricky platforming sections in some of the later levels, with jumps that require pixel-perfect timing. You get a few lives and get even more at certain score milestones, which is handy, but be careful because if you do die, then you'll lose your spread gun. Thankfully though, when you die, you do come back exactly where you died. If you do use a continue though, you'll be back to the start of the level, though you do get unlimited continues, which does help you practice. As you can see, the game looks great with some excellent level designs and the bosses are awesome, but a bit lacking in animation. In fact, the characters themselves are a little basic, though it all does the job. And yes, the controls are spot on, and it's another game where dying is always your fault. This is another game that's really great in two player co-op, but can also make it harder depending on who your player 2 is, as they can even steal your lives, bastards. When you've got the skills like me, you can blast through this game in about 30 minutes, but it's one that you will be coming back to time and time again, just like I do. So there you go, these are my 10 favourite games for the NES. Now I'm sure that some of you are angry that your favourites aren't here, but that's what a little thing called opinion means. But I do want to know your favourites, so make sure you comment below to let me know them. And now, all that's left for me to say is thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.